Above the old Inca town, up a nearly vertical slope, a local guide has found what looks like a burial niche. Astete and fellow archaeologist Elva Torres believe it may be undisturbed, a gravesite last touched 500 years ago. Hola, ¿qué tal, Richard? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Y la tumba? Ahí está el jefe de frente. Sí, aquí no, podemos empezar ya a hacer la apertura. Podemos ¿no? aperturar, sí. Eh, Richard, tú tendrías que. Vamos. Está bien. Before the tomb can be opened, Astete's Quechua guide makes an offering of coca leaves to the spirits that dwell here, just as his Inca forebearers would have done. A ver, pásame, pásame. Ya. Con cuidado no se vaya a caer las otras. Astete and Torres have investigated many other burials in the area. Most are far more accessible. This tomb has been constructed. The other tombs don't use this style. They are simply in caves, in natural rock formations that are easy to get to. In the dim tomb light, a human skull. As Torres enters the cramped tomb, the find only gets more tantalizing. It appears there's a couple of individuals. But as she investigates, she finds a lot more skeletons, nine in all. And many show signs of injury. Well, this problem regarding fractures, they could be from everyday activities. They could have been from a fall, something may have fallen on them, or perhaps some other sort of activity. In this case, they may have been working in the quarries. Could these be the skeletons of the builders of Machu Picchu? They can't be sure until they take a closer look in the lab. There, Torres is joined by bioarchaeologist Valerie Andrushko. Right away, they find some surprises in the skulls from the tombs near Parayakta. They're full of holes. It's the sign of a procedure called trepanation. Trepanation is the partial removal of part of the skull that the Inca practiced with very high degrees of success. Our understanding is that trepanation was often done in order to release intracranial pressure due to fractures. Its skull surgery and healed wounds found throughout the empire show that the Inca were skilled at using it to treat head trauma. When we see evidence for trauma, the question is always, is it related to accidents or is it related to violence? This individual right here, this is a complete fracture of the frontal bone. It has perforated all the way to the frontal sinus. This type of injury is not the type of injury that one would get from an accidental fall. To me, this is the type of injury more indicative of a weapon type injury, possibly indicative of warfare. In fact, Several skulls from the tombs show signs of blunt force trauma. The type of fracture you'd get from a club. So these weren't builders. 
they were likely warriors. Possibly, these individuals may have been engaged in defense of the sites around them, possibly engaged in defense of Machu Picchu. This revelation stands in stark contrast to the appearance of Machu Picchu as a religious sanctuary. This is a city dominated by sacred temples and shrines. The Temple of the Three Windows. The Temple of the Condor, named for its carved floor and stone wings. The elegantly curved Temple of the Sun, built on a rock that is illuminated on the solstice. And, at the highest point in the city, a stone pillar known as the Intiwatana. The evidence seems to be in conflict. Was Machu Picchu a military fortress? Or was it a religious center? The answer can perhaps be found in the ancient capital of Cusco, where the descendants of the Inca still live. Every year during the Roman Catholic festival of Corpus Christi, statues of the Virgin Mary, along with 15 other saints, are removed from the cathedral and brought to the square. These performers may be paying homage to Christian saints, but the instruments they play and the steps they move to are actually Inca in origin. That's because this Corpus Christi procession is a Christian revision of an Inca ritual. 500 years ago, the Inca also processed through Cusco. But they didn't carry statues of saints. They carried the mummies of their kings, whom they revered as gods. It was likely one of these kings who built Machu Picchu. The quality of the stonework alone suggests the city was royal. Fernando Estete estimates that it would have taken at least 50 years to complete. Since the Inca Empire only lasted a hundred years, focus has been on the earliest kings. The accounts of a Spanish Jesuit named Bernabe Cobo point to a dynamic leader who founded the Inca Empire, a king named Pachacuti. But no one could ever prove that Pachacuti built Machu Picchu. A small clue is hidden in his name, which means he who remakes the world. Pachacuti was sort of the Alexander the Great of the Incas. He was the one who started the expansion out of the Cusco region. And the Inca Empire began to expand tremendously over areas that had never been conquered by the Incas before. What we know of Pachacuti's history is due in part to Father Cobo. Cobo arrived in Peru after the conquest in the late 1500s and wrote his account based on interviews with descendants of the Inca. According to Father Cobo, Pachacuti was renowned as a builder. Having enlarged his empire with so many and such vast provinces, during the remainder of his life, this king devoted himself to building magnificent temples and palaces and strong castles. The beautiful stonework at Machu Picchu, so similar in style to Pachacuti's temples in other Inca cities, suggests that the same hand was behind the structures here. But the most convincing evidence linking Pachacuti to Machu Picchu comes from a Spanish register held in the colonial archives in Cusco. 
dated 1568, it mentions the town of Pichu with a clear reference to its owner, Inca Yupanqui, also known as Pachacuti. The evidence is convincing. It is Pachacuti, the first Inca emperor who ordered Machu Picchu's construction and in a place that would give any engineer pause. If I was called in by Pachacuti in order to uh, build Machu Picchu at that particular location, I would have gulped. Engineering-wise, it would seem almost impossible to handle. Fifteen years of study by hydrologist Ken Wright and a team of engineers is revealing how the Inca pulled this off. Because the steepness of the site isn't the only problem. Machu Picchu also receives torrential rains each year, triggering frequent landslides. And the site is crossed by not one, but two earthquake fault lines, making it a terrible place on which to build a city of stone. The location does have two virtues, a nearby freshwater spring and a supply of granite. There's a quarry right on the site. When the Inca engineers turned to building, their first step would have been to shore up the mountain. They did it by constructing a remarkable bulwark of terraces. As Estere's team rappels further down the cliff face, they're discovering hundreds of new terraces hidden below. Usually when people refer to Machu Picchu, they are only thinking about the Inca buildings on top of the ridge but construction has to begin at the bottom. In other words, you have to start with the terraces. Terraces are fundamental to Machu Picchu. While some terraces would have been used for small-scale farming, their primary purpose was to hold the mountain in place while draining a huge volume of rainwater away. That averages about uh, 76 inches per year and in terms of let's say uh, middle America that's a lot of water roughly two and a half times as much as the city of Chicago would get.